Welcome everyone to our third presentation of Opening the Doors to Christ's Love after a pause with Lockdown 4.0 here in Victoria. Again on behalf of Bernard, Bernard Wake and myself just to welcome you and thanks for tuning in to this uh, presentation as we continue the journey. Just to recap, uh, it was in the first week we talked about where the Catholic Church is in Australia today and where we are as parish and we reintroduced the Great Commission, that is Christ's original mission for the church. And then in the second uh, presentation, we discussed where we are being called back to the original mission for the church as given by Jesus over 2,000 years ago. And we discussed the growing momentum for parishes to move from maintenance to mission. And now in week three, as you can see, we will delve into how we will pursue this mission the process we will undertake, which involves an honest and thorough assessment of the five foundations for healthy parish growth. But again, let's first begin in prayer as we do, as we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. So I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we pray to you to bless and guide us as we embark on a journey to renew our parish with healthy growth. Speak to our hearts, open our minds. We pray to you for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit, igniting us with courage, passion and creativity. Help us, Lord, to deepen our love for you and welcome those outside into our community. Encourage us with your love and support with your love and support as we embrace your mission and your greatest commandment. Amen. Now before we uh, begin this presentation, let's review why I feel the need to convene these presentations with you. We know that things have changed with the global pandemic of COVID. We haven't been able to meet as a parish community in the way that we used to for nearly 18 months, so I seriously don't think we can go back to the way things were before. And maybe, unfortunately, the way things were before weren't as fruitful as possible. In the first week of our Opening the Doors presentations, we confronted the current reality that is. The most recent Australian census back in 2016 identified some startling statistics. The number of Catholics present at a weekend mass in Australia was 11.8%. 30% of Australians identified as having no religion. It was the first time no religion had overtaken Catholicism in Australia. And these are some very startling statistics. Particularly if we think back in 1921, 97% of people identified with a Christian religious group. And from 1947 to 1966, it remained at 88% here in Australia. So our parish is not immune. The number of Catholics with a connection with our parish is 9%. Now we've been good at sacramentalising them, but maybe not good at keeping them. And our weekend mass attendance has dropped by 35% comparing 2011 to 2019 in recent years. And the decline has been exacerbated, has been heightened as a result of COVID. We discussed the fact that the church today is very different to what it was because the rules have changed. The acceleration of social change, yet pastoral practices remain unchanged. Culture supported faith in church attendance. Demographic supported pastoral development, births and migrants. Build it, and they will come. Unfortunately, no longer applies. We also discussed the Aparaceta document, which is widely referred to as a source that captured the reasons why many Catholics have left the church to join other religious groups. And the main findings based on the interviews were the faithful had never experienced a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, one that was profound and intense within the Catholic Church, but had in other churches. The presence of meaningful community life where people are accepted and feel valued, visible and included in the church. They had not experienced this in a Catholic context, but did when they joined other churches. In the Catholic Church, they found that the biblical and doctrinal formation was theoretical and cold knowledge, whereas in other churches, it was something that brings about spiritual, personal and community growth and brings people to maturity. And finally, 
They did not find the missionary commitment that moves church members from pews to go out and meet those on the periphery to bring people. Sorry, to bring people home to the family of God. Now we have spoken about the need to return to Jesus' original mission for the church, that is to go back to go from a maintenance to a mission mode. Because the biggest crisis facing the church today, we have forgotten the church's mission given by Jesus to his disciples after his resurrection. We have contented ourselves with maintenance and maybe serving ourselves. We have not intentionally opened our doors to invite new people in. And maybe for some we didn't see this as our role. That is, our role to make disciples. Well, this is the mission that Jesus did give his disciples over 2,000 years ago and after his resurrection and before he ascended into heaven, as we read from Matthew's Gospel. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded of you, and know that I am with you until the end of time. And so this is the mission of the church yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And this is what we mean when we move this movement from maintenance to mission. This is what it's about. And again, just a reminder of the great commission of Jesus, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, love your neighbour as yourself. The return to the mission of the church has been proposed by popes and theologians for decades. And uh, Pope Francis, our friend, has continually advocated for it, as he says here from his encyclical title, Evangelii Gaudium, a dream of a missionary option, that is, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, Language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. All of which leads me to the new mission for our parish, which comes from both the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. We sum it up, sum it up as love God, love others, and to make disciples. So our parish mission is underpinned by our four strategic anchors. The first one being grow deeper in our faith and discipleship. The second is to grow wider, welcoming those outside in. Thirdly, to build leadership where we are called to serve and to finally create an exceptional weekend experience focusing on hospitality hymns and homilies, all under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Berna. Thanks, Andrew. An unintentional strategy will no longer suffice. It never did, but it was hard to measure until COVID helped us to see that Sunday mass attendance and parish engagement are not the same things. We are planning carefully how we approach our parish going forward, revitalising our parish going forward. Establishing heaps of programs and activities will not be the answer. We must carefully plan and discern. Thankfully, there are many resources, both locally and internationally, that will help us to plan appropriately. And we are also able to learn from parishes who have already undertaken this work, many of whom have documented their experiences and have created guidebooks, templates, online resources and much more. As we go forward, we need to thoroughly assess what barriers are blocking, obstructing and hindering our parish growth. And remember, when we say growth, we're not only talking about mass attendance with our current parishioners, but growth in reaching the Catholics and Christians who have no involvement with our parish, the 90% in Mordialic and Aspendale, who identify as Catholic according to the national census but have no relationship with our parish. Growth also means our personal growth. So in tonight's session, we are going to look at what we need to do as a thorough assessment based on five foundations. 
and this will allow us to assess where we can remove blockages to free up the growth pathway. So we'll reframe the fundamental question from what will make our parish grow to what is keeping our parish from growing. No program, event, new idea, tweaking of old ways or even a four week series of presentations entitled Opening the Doors will enable our parish to fully embrace and live out Jesus' great commission and greatest commandment. It's going to take an honest look at really what does work and what we need to improve on. Which brings us to the five foundations of healthy and disciple-making parishes. From a reading of the life of Jesus in the New Testament, these five foundations were central to his life and mission. They are why the church exists and what it is supposed to do. To build a strong, healthy, growing parish, we must spend time laying a foundation. These five foundations are also referred to as systems or purposes. And they are worship, service, community, discipleship and evangelisation. For any renewal to last the church, there must be plans to nurture and support it. We'll spend a fair amount of time on this presentation explaining the meaning of each of these five foundations. We now have a short video from Father James Mellon explaining the five foundations. Towards the end, he links the five foundations to the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. Please note in the video that Father James uses the word ministry instead of service and he calls them systems rather than foundations. And just as in the human body, so there are systems in the church, in the body of Christ. Worship, ministry, community, discipleship and evangelization. I get these from the Acts of the Apostles. It's very much echoed in this Parasita document. But before I go further into this, I want to stop and define these terms with you, to define them. Because this is important if we're going to do a self-assessment. We saw last week that there's obviously something wrong in Dartmouth in the church. All our vital signs are going down. They're all crashing. We've been unhealthy for decades. What is the cause of that health? I would say that we need to assess each of these systems and find out where there was a lack of health. But in order to do that, we have to define them. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone when you're using the same words but with different meanings and you're passing each other by. That ever happened to you? So let's take a moment to define these terms. Worship, this is very important. Worship is any time the mind and heart is lifted to God. Worship can happen anywhere. It can happen in the park, at home, walking down the street. And of course, it happens for us as Catholics in a liturgical way when we pray in the church, especially at the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the highest form of worship. So that's worship any time the mind and heart is being raised to God. Ministry is service. The word in Latin, English ministry comes from ministrare in Latin, which means simply to serve. Any time someone is serving, it's ministry. And that service can be internal, you know, being helping or serving in the office, serving in the liturgy, or it can be external because in one sense the whole point one of the points of internal service is to move the church outwards the next thing is community and i want to be clear again community is koinonia not as socializing there's a big difference christian community does not mean hanging out with your friends christian community is is where people are accountable to and for one another in our spiritual journeys with jesus at the center Discipleship is about growing and equipping people. And finally, evangelization is the explicit proclamation of Jesus. This is very important. Uh, Pope Paul VI said in 1975 that evangelization always involves the explicit proclamation of Jesus. He said, sooner or later, the witness of life must give way to the word of life. Sometimes as Catholics, we say, I evangelize with my life. Well, I certainly hope you do. And if you're not, keep your big mouth shut. Because we've got to lead with our lives. But then we've got to also speak. 
St. Peter says, always have your answer ready for those who ask the reason for your heart. You see, without actions or words are not believed, but without words our actions are not understood. It's both and, both and, with the primary one being our lives. The American pastor Rick Warren said this, a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission makes a great church. That's a great point. Let's look at that more closely. The great commandment. What's the great commandment? Do you remember? Remember? To love God, right? And someone said it. To love your neighbor, right? You'd agree that's a pretty good thing for us to do as a church, right? And then the great commission. We've just looked at that. We'll make disciples, right? Is the primary task. And then we baptize and we teach. So here's what I want to do. I want to link up these five tasks rooted in the great commandment and the great commission with the five systems. So what do you think? Loving God. Now there, think of these systems. This is why I like the biological example because while you can, you know, Dennis, you were a respiratory therapist uh, and you studied extra years to look at the respiratory system. But as much as you could isolate the system in terms of study, you can't physically pull it out of the body, right? Because it's connected to every, everything's connected to everything. But it doesn't mean you can't look in a particular way at each system. So although even in the body of Christ, everything is connected to everything, what system does loving God most closely correspond to? What do you think? No, I mean the system in terms of worship, evangelization, ministry. Remember those five systems, you sure? What do you think? So, well, how about, I'm going to say worship, right? I mean, can you can you really worship God if you don't love God? I mean, worship is rooted in love, a heart that loves God. We, we love God and we, we hope that love overflows. That's why that's... Jesus said this, the Father desires those who worship in spirit and in truth. So what about loving our neighbor? What system does that correspond to? You think? So, so I, okay, so we're, we're friends. I ignore your needs. Sooner or later, you're going to say, that Father James is full of you know why. But he's just, he's, he just talks about love and name only because he never does what? Never serves. That's right. Ministry. We show our love for one another by serving one another. A church that never serves is a church that's low on love. A church that is inward focus or only serves, here's a, a hard saying, a church that only serves itself is probably a church that's low on love. In terms of our impact on the community outside. Loving neighbor is linked to ministry. Go make disciples. That's evangelization, right? You already established that. Evangelization is about making disciples. What about baptism? There's only two left. Community. Most people don't get this. I'll tell you why. Because we don't think of baptism as being connected with community. But baptism is a sacrament of initiation into the life of the church. We've developed a practice that has totally severed the baptism from having anything to do with community. We baptize people, or even the children of people who have no connection to the community, and a, even an overt intention to never have anything to do with the community. What a crazy quote. But baptism is about community. And finally, teaching is linked to what? There's the only one left. Discipleship. Discipleship. Thank you, Tiff. And just as in the human body, so there are systems in the church, in the body of Christ. Worship, ministry, community, discipleship, and evangelization. I get these from the Acts of the Apostles. It's very much echoed in this Aparecida document. But before I go further into this, I want to stop and define these terms with you, to define them. Because this is important. If we're going to do a self-assessment, we saw last week, that there's obviously something wrong in Dartmouth in the church. All our vital signs are going down. They're all crashing. We've been unhealthy for decades. What is the cause of that health? I would say that we need to assess each of these systems and find out where there is a lack of health.
But in order to do that, we have to define them. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone when you're using the same words but with different meanings and you're passing each other by? Has that ever happened to you? So let's take a moment to define these terms. Worship, this is very important. Worship is any time the mind and heart is lifted to God. Worship can happen anywhere. It can happen in the park, at home, walking down the street. And of course, it happens for us as Catholics in a liturgical way when we pray liturgically, especially at the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the highest form of worship. So that's worship anytime the mind and heart has been raised to God. Ministry is service. The word in Latin, in English, ministry comes from ministrare in Latin, which means simply to serve. Anytime someone is serving, it's ministry. And that service can be internal, you know, being helping, you know, serving in the office, serving at the liturgy, or it can be external because in one sense, the whole point, one of the points of internal service is to move the church outwards. The next thing is community. And I want to be clear, again, community as koinonia, not as socializing. There's a big difference. Christian community does not mean hanging out with your friends. Christian community is, is where people are accountable to and for one another in our spiritual journeys, with Jesus at the center. Discipleship is about growing and equipping, you know, growing people. And finally, evangelization is the explicit proclamation of Jesus. This is very important. Uh, Pope Paul VI said in 1975 that evangelization always involves the explicit proclamation of Jesus. He said, sooner or later, the witness of life must give way to the word of life. Sometimes as Catholics, we say, I evangelize with my life. Well, I certainly hope you do. And if you're not, keep your big mouth shut. Because we've got to lead with our life. But then we've got to also speak. St. Peter says, always have your answer ready for those who ask the reason for your hope. You see, without actions, our words are not believed, but without words, our actions are not understood. It's both and, both and, with the primary one being our lives. The American pastor Rick Warren said this, a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission makes a great church. That's a great quote. Let's look at that more closely. The great commandment. What's the great commandment? Do you remember? Remember? To love God, right? And someone said it. To love your neighbor, right? You'd agree that's a pretty good thing for us to do as a church, right? And then the Great Commission, we've just looked at that. Go make disciples, right? Is the primary task. And then we baptize and we teach. So well, here's what I want to do. I want to link up these five tasks rooted in the Great Commandment and the Great Commission with the five systems. So what do you think? Loving God. Now, there, think of these systems. This is why I like the biological example because while you can, you know, Dennis, you were a respiratory therapist, uh, and you studied extra years to look at the respiratory system. But as much as you could isolate the system in terms of study, you can't physically pull it out of the body, right? Because it's connected to every, everything's connected to everything. It doesn't mean you can't look in a particular way at each system. So although even in the body of Christ, everything is connected to everything, what system does loving God most closely correspond to? What do you think? Hmm? No, I mean the system in terms of worship, evangelization, ministry. Remember those five systems I showed? So what do you think? So, well, how about, I'm going to say worship, right? I mean, can you, can you really worship God if you don't love God? I mean, worship is rooted in love, a heart that, that loves God. We, we love God and we, we, that love overflows. That's why that's, Jesus said this, the Father desires those who worship in spirit and in truth. So what about loving our neighbor? Well, what system does that correspond to? You think? So, so I, okay, so we're, we're friends. I ignore your needs. Sooner or later, you're going to say, that Father James is full of you know what. And he's just, he's, he just talks about love and name only because he never does what? He never serves. That's right. Ministry. We show our love for one another by serving one another. 
A church that never serves is a church that's low on love. A church that is inward focus or only serve, here's a, a hard saying, a church that only serves itself is probably a church that is low on love in terms of our impact on the community outside. Loving neighbor is linked to ministry. Go make disciples, that's evangelization, right? We already established that. Evangelization is about making disciples. What about baptism? There's only two left. Community. Most people don't get this. I'll tell you why. Because we don't think of baptism as being connected with community. But baptism is a sacrament of initiation into the life of the church. We've developed a practice that has totally severed the baptism from having anything to do with community. We baptize people, or even the children of people, who have no connection with the community, and an, even an overt intention to never have anything to do with the community. It's kind of crazy what we do. But baptism is about community. And finally, teaching is linked to what? It's the only one left. Discipleship. Discipleship. Father James. So let's now again explain the five foundations for a healthy and fruitful church and our parish. The first one is that of worship. The encounter with God's mercy in the Eucharist and other sacraments, prayer and devotions. It's our conscious decision to place the Great Commission, the command to make disciples at the heart of our parish identity and action means discerning and enacting new ways to strengthen our worship of God. Our primary act of worship is the celebration of the Eucharist. And worship can mean many other elements, such as prayer meetings, adoration, praying before the Blessed Sacrament, times of praise experienced all in small groups. Now our primary act of worship is the celebration of the Eucharist, which is the Eucharist bringing people together into an intimate experience, uh, an intimate encounter with Jesus. Now the weekend experience is where over 80% of our parishioners and visitors encounter our parish. And so in the final session next week, we will be covering air ideas that address our fourth strategic anchor. The weekend experience um, being is priority number one, and it uh, covers plans for hospitality, hymns, and homilies, again, under the fourth H, which is that of the Holy Spirit. So let's move to the second foundation titled service. The ability to influence, serve, and move people toward the work of building God's kingdom. It includes the ministry of service within the life of the parish so that it can function, but also to go out and to serve those who don't belong. As this piece of scripture uh, reveals the Holy Spirit has been given to each and every one of us gifts that allow us to serve. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and some teachers to equip the saints for the built work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Service. When you serve the parish, you serve God. You demonstrate your love for God because you are helping God to achieve God's mission. Now everyone can participate in our parish mission. Everyone can be involved in serving our parish. And again, in next week's final session, we'll invite you to consider where you would like to be involved. We are all called to serve. We need to move away from who's available to the discernment of each of us to contribute with the gifts God has given us. I and I know many parishioners are incredibly grateful for our wonderful volunteers, which includes Eucharistic ministers, readers, lectors, sacristans, choir members, catechists, collectors, ministers to the sick, the housebound, those who are on teams like the Safe Child Safeguarding Committee, Bereavement, Baptism Preparation, Liturgy Team, our parish communications, and all our welcomers, and so on. Incredible volunteers. 
As we embark on our Opening the Doors mission, I am encouraging as many of you as possible to step forward to help us achieve fully our mission. And there will be roles available in each of the five foundation areas and we'll begin to the discussion about what, about what this might look like next week. I particularly like these words from Pope Francis, which defines what it means to serve with our actions, especially, particularly to those outside the parish. Create a space inside yourself to listen and then act. Call up, go visit, offer your service. Say you don't have a clue what they do, but maybe you can help. Say you'd like to be part of a different world and you thought this might be a good place to start. The true measure of a healthy missionary parish is not how many lectors a parish has, not how many ministers of the Eucharist a parish has, etc., but the proportion of parishioners who are going out to serve those who are not currently members of our parish. Again, with this beautiful image of Pope Francis, he hits the nail on the head when he says, I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. When we focus on helping others and honouring Christ, we soon discover that our needs are met far more deeply than we ever experienced otherwise. It's not about what I want from you, but what I want for you. By serving, we grow as disciples and develop a deeper relationship with Jesus. And I don't want you to think that this is about just helping Father Andrew out, helping me out, because we know it's all deeper than that. We'll all be rewarded in ways that maybe we never expected when we serve the mission of Christ. Maybe there's a sense of healing or wholeness, forgiveness, a growing capacity to love and forgive others, and much, much more. Let's not limit that to the Holy Spirit with what the Holy Spirit can offer. The rewards are great. Let's now move on to the third foundation, community. The experience of belonging to a meaningful community. And the parish is a community of communities. This is not just about the friendships that we have with each other at Mass or in our parish. As Father James reminded us in the recent video, Christian community is where people are accountable to and for one another in our spiritual journeys with Jesus at the centre. So we ask, are all people known, loved and supported in their faith? Do we consciously or unconsciously exclude others? are all accepted, no matter their socio-economic, ethnic backgrounds, gender, or how often they come to Mass. Just to take one aspect of community, and it is often the elephant in the room, when I was doing focus research groups for our parish pastoral plan, many people voiced their concern and disappointment about school families who no longer come to Mass. So we need to ask, how can we revitalise, renew and grow mutual relationships between our parish and school communities? We had some clues as to how some school families feel about how welcome they feel coming to Mass with the Plenary Council feedback back in our first week's presentation. But obviously what we have or have not been doing has not achieved the goal of a close parish school community. So once again, we need to review that listen to the concerns and change tack. Let's also remember how Jesus went about his ministry. A reflection of the Gospel's accounts of Jesus' earthly ministry reveals many levels of engagement among the people who surrounded Jesus. The openness of Jesus warns us against regarding people as lacking in faith if they are unable to adopt a disciple's particular way of life or if it is something completely alien to them. In Jesus' time, not all were disciples. Some were simply followers or occasional fellow travellers. Today's church is no different. Faith journeys are diverse, are they are as diverse as they are deeply personal. 
The reality is that good people are doing good work both in parish and in our schools. Our teachers are working really hard to nurture our children. This photo shows aged care residents from Nixon House Mercy Aged Care in Mordialloc coming to an anointing mass with St Bridget's students in November 2019. This was a special mass for so many of the Nixon House residents who had been unengaged who, who had attended the mass. Faces lit up and the pastoral director, Mari Angela of Nixon House, said to me that people who had been unengaged for a very long time were suddenly aglow and happy. I experienced it myself with people getting down on the kneelers, responding to the mass responses and just being so happy to be back in a church. The St Bridget students have been visiting Nixon House, the aged care residence across the road from St Bridget's School, for a number of years. Beautiful relationships have been formed. We must do more of this with the many other aged care facilities in our community. It needs coordination and planning. Is this an area you would like to help with? Again, engaging our school communities in the parish mission is not just about mass attendance. Our parish and school communities can work together on social justice initiatives like our Justice Action Group and Vinnie's. These outreach opportunities to work together as parish and school can be a great way to foster a stronger community. Take the example of the wonderful Sister Bridget Arthur from the Bridgetine Asylum Seekers Project shown here. In March 2021, the 86-year-old has joined eight students from across Australia in a landmark case seeking to block the expansion of the Whitehoven coal mine in New South Wales. People like Sister Bridget show the way with their living of the gospel in her tireless work to help the oppressed, like those seeking asylum and her concern for our planet. Remember in one of our previous presentations when we said one of the reasons some people don't step up to serve in the parish is because they feel they're too old. Sister Bridget clearly, does, clearly doesn't subscribe to that theory. How fortunate are we to have these four exceptional schools in our community? We know that often after the transition from primary school, it can be harder to engage families. But going forward, let's give ourselves the challenge to engage more, work alongside each other, work together on joint outreach initiatives. The church continues to challenge itself to go to the peripheries. After all, children and families at those, these peripheries are often present in Catholic schools. In this way, Catholic schools are a gift to the fundamental mission of the church. With the periphery near and in the midst of the parish, the challenge is to open the door, step out to be with and to welcome. A quote from the Catholic Education in South Australia. An example I heard of recently was parishioners holding a morning tea for teachers on National Teachers' Day. A simple idea that builds bridges to more fully connect. Discipleship and community are inextricably connected. For while discipleship of the Lord begins and continues with a personal and intimate encounter with Jesus, it is never individualistic. Community can draw people into the journey of discipleship when they experience meaningful relationships in which they are known and loved and they can be inspired to go out to share this joy of belonging in Christ with their neighbour. Again, the last word from Pope Francis on the foundation of community. We know that a sure sign of a healthy community is that we want others to become a part of our community and other people want to become a part of us, experiencing our parishes as places of welcome and growth. The fourth foundation, discipleship, growth in holiness, faith and understanding. To be a disciple is to be a learner who sits at the feet of Jesus, grows in faith and understanding over time, and is sent to witness and convey to others the truth of God's love in Christ. Being an adult learner in the church is entirely optional. Catechesis is usually just for children. Father James Mellon says, we catechise our children and bless adults, but we should bless children and catechise adults. 
I'll be the first to say, put my hand up and say, I don't know nearly enough about the Gospels or the Bible overall, but I am keen to change that and have started as a result of this journey with our parish. My mum and dad had a Bible, a beautiful leather bound one, but I'm pretty sure the only time it was open was when mum put the record of immunisations for my brothers and I as babies into one of the pages. That's no criticism of my beloved mum and dad, but for many years I thought reading the Bible was something that only Protestants did. Do we support each other on our journey of faith and discipleship? Do we enable everyone to have a deep personal relationship with Jesus? Remember, one of the reasons we have heard from research with lapsed Catholics is that they never developed a deep personal relationship with Jesus. Going forward, we plan to invite people to establish small groups where people can safely share their testimonies of how they enrich their faith and the struggles we all share at times when our faith is tested. In small groups, people can experience belonging, accountability and grow together in faith, vital to the fostering of intentional discipleship. In turn, these groups can serve as evangelical contexts places to invite those who are lukewarm or not yet practising their faith. The best way to be a disciple of Christ is through an apprenticeship, linking an experienced Christian believer or mentor with one who seeks a deeper relationship with Christ and his church. Just as trades like electricians, plumbers, carpenters have apprenticeships, so do we need to foster apprenticeships or mentors, mentors for discipleship. You can do a course, read a book, but to really learn, you need to learn from someone who has been there and can teach you. There are many people within our parish community that have the gifts to be discipleship mentors. I have benefited from their deep faith and spirituality personally. As Sherry Waddell reminds us in her book, Forming Intentional Disciples, the goal is to move people intentionally through the process of spiritual conversion and maturity. This slide shows Sherry's five thresholds of conversion. The five thresholds or stages of conversion to intentional discipleship are trust in Jesus, the church, a Christian, curiosity about the person, life or teachings of Jesus, openness to spiritual change, seeking actively to know God, and intentional discipleship by making a conscious commitment to follow Jesus in the church. Without a plan, we will operate with a hodgepodge of programs, events and classes. With a goal, we will get to know when it, where someone needs to go and how we can help to move them there. With the Discipleship Foundation, we will, we will be developing plans for all who are interested, and hopefully that will be many of us, to grow in faith, knowledge and prayer. People will be able to move through at different stages. Parishes that are thriving with a missionary fo disciple focus have a common denominator, flourishing small groups. And we can be proud in our parish that we have a base to build from with our prayer group, and our scripture and friendship group. For over 40 years, the Steubenville Conferences and outreach of the Franciscan University of Steubenville in North America have been helping people develop the relationship with God they desire. These conferences involve over 60,000 teens and adults every year. They've come to the realisation that a single conference needs to be followed through on a parish level. In 2017, the Franciscan University of Steubenville embarked on a year-long research project to determine a discipleship model that results in forming disciples who are also disciple, disciple makers, which they call spiritual multiplication. What they came up with was the discipleship quad, which involves groups of four people who journey together as disciples through weekly gatherings of fellowship, learning and ongoing conversation. Let's listen to a short video about the Franciscans' discipleship quad.
As Jesus began his public ministry, he called disciples, apostles, to come and follow him. And they, in turn, were given the mission of going out and creating disciples over the whole world. If you are going to make a disciple of Jesus Christ and you want to be his disciple, then know you have a commitment to the body of Christ and to other humans in the world by helping them to become followers of Christ and being disciples. The Steubenville Discipleship Quad is answering that call to go make disciples in the world. They're equipping us with tools and information that help us become the disciples that Christ has called us to be. In today's day and age when things are crazy and you don't know what end is up, Sometimes I find myself being on an island not knowing where to go or who to talk to about challenges and about growing in my faith. The Discipleship Quad provides an amazing opportunity to meet with like-minded men who are family-driven, who love the faith, and want to grow to know the Lord in a deeper way. Some of the things that you might grow in and learn as a part of these quads are how to pray, uh, how to deepen your relationship with Mary and the church, uh, why we should tithe, how to have hope in the midst of suffering, maybe how to share your faith with others. So there's so many ways that this quad can help you grow as a person in your relationship with Christ and how to share that faith with others. The process of a Steubenville Discipleship Quad is simple and easy to do. Four people gather together on a weekly basis to pray, experience fellowship and accountability as you grow in your understanding of Catholic truth and how to apply it to your lives. In the gospel, Jesus models two types of ministry. One is program ministry and the other one is relational ministry. In relational ministry, we seek to multiply disciples. My discipleship quad consisted of women from my office and it was an incredible opportunity for us to take time out of our week to come together outside of work to really share how we were doing, joys and struggles, what God is doing in our life, how our prayer is going, and to really support one another. The Discipleship Quad provides a great opportunity each week to come back and address the things you challenge each other with the week before to see how much you've progressed and also to provide opportunities to grow in the faith in the week ahead. The end goal of all this is that once you've completed all the materials and resources in the guidebook is that you would go out and find three other people and start a new quad, thus leading to spiritual multiplication. So if I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, I want to continue to make and multiply more and more disciples long beyond the individuals that I work with and through all the ones they will in turn work with. These weekly moments, these weekly opportunities are a great way to, come, to not only grow in the faith, but to also have accountability amongst you and friends. I challenge and encourage each one of you to join this amazing group. See, the disciple is used by the Holy Spirit to multiply themselves in others. And that's what we're called to do. Closer to home, the Diocese of Wollongong offers a program for small groups to follow called Faith Circles. It allows people to journey in faith with people they come to know, love and trust. These will be safe places for people to share their own lived experience with God. All the evidence shows that living and growing in our faith is best done as part of a small group, turning rows of pews and chairs into growth. Thanks, Bernard. That brings us to our final foundation for healthy church growth, that of that very scary word which we know is evangelization. So bear with me. And again, it does need to be redefined. So it is to bring others into an encounter and friendship with the person of Jesus Christ. And from Mark's Gospel, let us go on to the neighbouring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. So yes, it is primarily directed at those outside the church, but may also be aimed at those within the church who know about Jesus, but maybe don't know him personally or deeply. Now, it must be approached as invitational, welcoming, non-judgmental and listening. It is never, I am right and you are wrong. And when we think about evangelization, this could be the same as simply as inviting a friend to the Justice Action Group picnic for refugees. Just that invitation would be a chance to see our parish extending the hand of friendship to others. Something that Jesus would do. It's as simple as that. As we have seen, the mission of the church is to evangelize. All his preaching and teaching, his miracles, his gathering and sending of the disciples, even his cross and resurrection, are part of this basic ministry that is called evangelization. 
For Jesus, evangelization was his commitment to bring the good news of God's kingdom to everyone, including some unlikely people. Jesus didn't just do this in his hometown and regulars at the local synagogue. He insisted on reaching those who do not know God. And thank you to Pope Francis who says, The church is not a private club, but a missionary movement that reaches beyond itself, appealing to those who are poor, suffering, marginalised or in need. It lives by the conviction that Jesus never stops welcoming and speaking with everyone, even with those who no longer expect to encounter God in their life. Mary Catherine Hilkert is a member of the Dominican Sisters of Peace and a professor of theology at the University of Notre Dame. Now, Sister Mary says in her book, which is titled Naming Grace, the call is not to speak at people about things they are not interested in yet, but to listen for the gaps, the need, the beauty or pain that open a space for God's name to be heard and gratefully and hopefully received. And this is the power of words spoken in the right time, spoken out of love. We must never try to convert people by, to our way of thinking. And look, while we do want what is best for them, we should never be pushy, argumentative, aggressive or annoying. Rather, be personable, affable, interested them in them and genuine. Because proclaiming the gospel does not entail pushing religion, but rather sharing the values which are important to us and allowing people to make their own free decision as to how they would like to respond. Now, when we think about ways to gently invite the outside in while strengthening our foundation of evangelization, one way is actually through an evangelization tool like Alpha or Sycamore that allows people particularly the unchurched, to dip their toe in the water, to understand more about life and the Christian faith. Now, Sarah raised this in our session in week two, when she shared that she was looking for an entry point to ask questions about the Holy Trinity, about God. Now, this could be an approach that we may consider as we action grow wider, inviting the outside in. Look, I do know that the St. Louis community ran Alpha many years ago. Again, this is just a short intro into Alpha, which gives us a little bit of background. I think Alpha can do what is since the beginning, the most important job for a Christian, bring people to Jesus. For more than three decades now, the popes have been calling the whole church to a new evangelization. And yet, if you look at the actual state of the church in many parts of the world, you don't see the numbers of practicing Catholics growing. You see quite the opposite. And you see particularly that we're having a hard time reaching this current young generation. We have centuries of experience in catechesis, but we have kind of lost the art of evangelizing those who don't know the gospel at all. So Alpha is like retraining us in how to do that and it does it in such an attractive way that really speaks to people's lives. Alpha offers a very human, non-threatening door for everyone to enter. Each Alpha night consists of three elements. There is the food, which is the table fellowship. We can come together and have a great meal. Uh, secondly, there is a presentation of some simple and clear element of the gospel message. And third is discussion. So after the presentation of this gospel message, we ask our guests, so what do you think? And we get to listen and engage in dialogue and discussion in a completely non-confrontational, but incredibly compelling and loving and challenging, but inviting way. This is legitimately and genuinely fun. I think Alpha works, especially for our Catholic parishes, in encouraging a culture of invitation in bringing people together in community for diverse experience and giving them a taste of the gospel. I think Alpha for the Catholic Church is more than just a program. I think it's a catalyst for church renewal. What's so exciting about Alpha is the love. The love that you see begin to grow in the communities. On our team at the parish, we have this saying, Alpha as a course is fantastic. 
Alpha as a culture is phenomenal. And that's really when the essence of what makes Alpha works, when it's absorbed into your church, it changes everything of who you are as an invitational and as a missionary church, raising up leaders, equipping people, and mobilizing your whole church for mission. When we've run Alpha in the parish, we see people change. People come to know Jesus, they experience the Holy Spirit in a new way, and they form amazing friendships that, that go on to flourish within the church. And ultimately, when people are changed, the church is changed. So just in summary, the five foundations of the church benefit the flourishing of our parish and ourselves are evangelization helps us fulfill Jesus's mission, service helps us find our talents, community helps us face life's joys and struggles, discipleship helps us strengthen our faith, and finally worship helps us to focus on Jesus. And just as the human body needs all of its systems working well, to be healthy and free of disease, so too does the church need its systems or foundations all working well to be healthy and fruitful. Now over the coming months we will be thoroughly assessing the health of the five foundations in our parish before we start any specific actions and changes as to how we as a parish operate against the five foundations. And Bernard will explain a little bit more about this process shortly. As mentioned at the beginning, these five foundations are widely recognised as the essential purposes or systems of the church. There are many guides to assist us as we thoroughly assess the health of each one of these in our parish, including this Sydney Archdiocesan new mission plan titled Go Make Disciples. Divine Renovation also have an excellent guidebook which provides a step-by-step -step manual which we'll also be drawing from. These foundations are not isolated ends in themselves, but are deeply interconnected aspects of life of each disciple of Jesus and of Eucharistic community seeking to form missionary disciples of Jesus. As such, strategies concerning one foundation will always depend upon and relate to other foundations. For example, we may build our foundation of evangelization in our parish, but if there is no welcoming community to receive newcomers, or formation programs to deepen discipleship, then our efforts in evangelization will be stunted. Thanks again, Andrew. We can't just rush in right into actions with regards to five foundations. We'll be undertaking a four-step process before putting each of the five foundations into place. And very briefly, the steps will be Firstly, to reflect, then to review, then to discern and decide, and finally, to act. And this entire process may take up to six months to fully complete. Very briefly, to describe the four-step process that we'll be undertaking to assess the five foundations, the first step will be to reflect upon the place of that foundation in the life of Jesus and in our community. One such reflection on the foundation of evangelization in the life of Jesus would be John's Gospel recount of Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman at the well. It demonstrated how Jesus went beyond borders, communities and places of comfort to people who are hurting or thirsting, but do not always know what they need. When it comes to under, uh, how we might understand our wider Mordialic and Aspendale community when it comes to evangelisation and how we might go about it, we can also review an abundance of social data. The National Centre for Pastoral Research produced reports on a wide range of social indicators among all people who live within the parish boundaries. For example, how many people act as carers, unemployment rates, homelessness rates, housing statistics and religious identification. And this can help identify needs, problems and gifts in our community that could be a starting point in considering strategies and practices of evangelisation. 
The second step in the process of reviewing and assessing each of the five foundations is to review how the foundation ex is expressed in the actions of our parish community. This kind of assessment may prove challenging, but the only real starting point is the reality of our current circumstances. One of the practical evaluation tools we, we will use to evaluate all of the five foundations is a SWOT analysis, an assessment of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Once completed, the resulting information will help us identify areas for response. A second practical evaluation tool for reviewing each foundation that we will use is to measure how much practical support, time and priority we as a parish currently give to each foundation. By the time we get to the third step in the process, we should now be clear on the place of the particular foundation in our identity as a parish and how it is being expressed in the actions of our community. This step is to discern, vision and decide how God might be calling our community to strengthen that particular foundation. In the case of the foundation of evangelisation, this means thinking and praying about our parish community, as well as the people we have thought about who are currently outside of the parish. As mentioned in the first stage of the process, where we reflect on the wider community and their demographic trends, age, spiritual background, life stage and key questions they are asking, we can then begin to intentionally shape our parish strategies of invitation, inquiry, community and formation with this group in mind. When we undertake the visioning work, we will ask the question for each of the five foundations. Five years from now, your parish has begun to mobilise and churchgoers are encountering Jesus and making decisions to follow him as disciples. What does it all look like? And the final part of the four part process for each of the five foundations will be to choose the actions that we will undertake mapping them over a three to five year period, plan period. There are many excellent resources to help us with the assessment and practical applications of the five foundations, including the Divine Renovation Guidebook and the Sydney Archdiocese Go Make Disciples Mission Plan. The bulk of this work will be undertaken by the Parish Pastoral Council and a new senior leadership team but we would like to open it up for more parishioners to get involved in the assessments and discussions. More details to follow in the coming weeks. Together with a detailed assessment of the five foundations, we will also be undertaking a parish culture assessment. Making the leap from where we are now to our parish mission requires a culture that is totally committed to the mission. The biggest challenge of all in achieving our mission is a change in culture. We must have leadership at all levels that is totally committed to the vision process, to the vision and the process. Culture by definition is the beliefs and customs of a particular group, a way of thinking, behaving or working that exists in a place or organisation. It is quite literally who our parish is and is shown in what we value. Culture in many ways is like an iceberg, 90% of which sits below the waterline. It's not what we say or think we do, but actually what we do do. We might not be able to see the culture, but it is there in everything we do. How we relate to people, are we welcoming, accepting, reliable, adaptive, adaptable, growth oriented and so on. As Father James Mellon says, culture is extremely powerful. It does not matter how well researched, developed or organised your latest strategy is, it will not succeed if the current culture does not support it. As the management consultant guru Puta Drucker says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. All the plans and strategies in the world will not come to fruition if we don't have the right culture. Very briefly, this is the three step process we'll be undertaking. Firstly, we will define our current culture, values and behaviours amongst our parishioners, volunteers and staff. Secondly, we will develop a vision for our culture. And then lastly, develop a plan to shape our culture, the values we commit to, how we will intentionally model them and how we will live them. And there are templates that will be able to help us guide, guide us through this process.
Thanks again, Bernard. We're coming close to the end of this uh, virtual presentation. And again, um, what is the mission I'm setting out for our parish? Again, it's simply summarised with the words on the screen. To love God, love others, and make disciples. And again, our parish mission is underpinned by four strategic anchors to grow deeper in faith and discipleship, to grow wider in welcoming those outside in, to build leadership where we are all called to serve, and to create an exceptional weekend experience, experience focusing on hospitality, hymns and homilies, all under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In the final presentation, we'll make a very specific as to the path forward, including how you can get involved. And we'll discuss the new organisational structure that will underpin our new direction forward. We look forward to seeing you online for this final presentation very soon. Thank you to Burn Awake and thank you all for tuning in. of days, brief stars into space, make the wind and the waves, before life began, we were your plan, you made us for love, in your holy hands, our God is love. Oh